welcome to the seventh annual field report. Um, seven of these already, it's quite amazing. Um, and let's get stuck into uh, hearing a little bit about what's been going on in Badlands Dinosaur Museum here in Dickinson, North Dakota in the last year. And then um, also, of course, lots of information from our field work. In fact, so much I've barely managed to cram, I don't know, two thirds of what we've done in here this year. So uh, before I start, um, please consider donating um, at DickinsonMuseumCenter.com. We've actually changed our website recently, but that will get you there. Um, it's all rerouting. Um, so we, we do rely on support from various different people uh, who we very much appreciate. So a little outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'll introduce a few of the people here, talk about some of the museum news, and then talk about uh, discoveries from field work. I'll probably take about 45 minutes and then um, we'll switch over to a live section. So I'll put you on um, a camera and we'll be showing you stuff that's in collections, answering questions, all that kind of thing. So uh, this slide's got a bit bigger this year. Um, this is our various paleo staff, uh, contractors and interns here at the museum. And some of us are here today uh, doing the presentation. Um, so uh, there's me in the top left, and then top right, my wife, Dr. Liz Friedman Fowler. She's at Dickinson State University. She's a professor there. Uh, Amanda's our preparator in the bottom left. And then Kelsey, she was our intern this summer. So um, she did a great job working with uh, visitors to the museum and doing all sorts of activities for families, that kind of thing. Steve is our preparator uh, in the lab. He runs the lab and all the volunteers that go there. And then Anna Marie... Um, was our um, contractor. She was helping us do a whole bunch of preparation, getting some more of these specimens prepped. So we actually have a lot of a lot of new things that have been cleaned up that I've got to get out and exhibit. And I also wanted to say a big thank you to um, all of our volunteers. I do have a list of the field volunteers at the end of the um, talk, but these are our volunteers who are currently working in the lab, and there's there some really great people there. Um, and they've been really helping plow through some of these fossils. So if you want to, um, if you want to uh, volunteer in the lab, email me, denver.fowler at dickinsongov.com, or visit our website and find our volunteer pages um, and um, come along. And uh, we have so many fossils to clean up of all different skill levels. Um, we're getting some, some of our volunteers are getting really skilled now too, so they work on some of the most difficult stuff. It's really good, really good. A um, little unusual, um, in conjunction with Dickinson State University, um, we're going to be offering a new class at DSU in spring, so January 9th to May 7th. This is called Evolutionary Paleobiology. Um, so this is a live online discussion class. Um, it'll be in classroom for local students who take it, but online for non-local students. Um, it's open to anyone worldwide, so, and there's no prerequisites for the course. So these are transferable credits, two of them uh, you can transfer to your institution. Um, this is part of a uh, new sort of trying to get a paleo program running at uh, Dickinson State. And so this is kind of a first step in that. Um, as um, credit, it's uh, $670 total for those two credits for people from the Western United States. And then the out of state or international fee is $810. Um, and it's half price for auditing that class. And if you're interested in that, um, if you email Dr. Liz Friedman Fowler, you can see her address there, elizabeth.friedman at dickinsonstate.edu. Um, this is, um, hopefully this will be an exciting new class. There's a bunch of people already on the course and we'll, it's open worldwide, hopefully be part of a affordable paleontology track biology degree. Okay, so what's going on in the museum? Well, I've been doing a lot of 3D printing, so we've been very lucky to have these two 3D printers chugging along, and that's been really good for us to get um, new exhibits up <clears throat> and uh, new specimens and new, um, let's see, new specimens, new skulls, things to take to schools or to, to show people who visit the museum. Um, so there's a selection of things that I've been printing there. Uh, we're also using the 3D printers to reconstruct some of the specimens that we've been collecting, um, including some of those tyrannosaurs. So um, part of that Tyrannosaur project, here you can see Amanda using one of our 3D scanners, uh, the Revo Point Mini in this one. And uh, she's scanning the jaws and in fact all the skull bones 
from um, the B2 Tyrannosaurus Sisyphus, that's the holotype of Despletosaurus wilsoni. So the plan for this is to get all these 3D scans together. I've just sent them to our 3D artist, uh, Justin, and he's putting them together and he's going to sculpt the missing bones, which is basically the brain case in the back of the lower jaw. And then we'll be able to 3D print a complete skull of uh, Despletosaurus wilsoni to have on exhibit next to the real fossils. Um, and hopefully we should be able to print out some little versions of these skulls and they'll be able to sell them in the shop. So I think they should be quite popular. I know I'll have one on my wall. Uh, anyway, um, we've also got some great new lab equipment. Um, Wes has been helping, he helped build an air abrasive box. So some of the bones that you'll see later on in this talk have been cleaned up using what's called an air abrasive. And this is a like, a, it fires bicarbonate of soda a uh, very high speed through a little handpiece, and it picks off very, very fine sediment from the bone. So it allows us to get a much cleaner, crisper finish to the bone um, than you might be able to get using just hand tools. Um, we've also just recently got a couple of microscopes, a couple of new microscopes, well, the second hand microscopes, but a couple of microscopes in the lab, um, which Steve is very pleased about. And that allows us to get, obviously, up close with the bones, and really see better what we're doing. So we have a few more microscopes in the lab now, really cool. Um, new fossils mean visits from researchers. So uh, Paleo Royalty, Tom Holtz visited us this summer and took a look at some of our Tyrannosaur material and also uh, helped us identify some of the bones from little raptors. Um, so that was really cool, uh, very, very cool. So onto the field work. And some of the results, um, we do field work in a couple of different formations. We work in the Hell Creek Formation a little bit. Um, so this is 66 million years old um, here in North Dakota, but also mostly in Montana. Uh, we also work in the Judith River Formation in Montana. So that's about 78 million years old. So dinosaurs that were around 10 million years before they went extinct. We work about three months, pretty much the whole of June through to early September. Um, and we work on public lands. So we have a few different land management agencies we work with, specifically the BLM and the Bureau of Rec. And then this year we also did some work on Montana State Land. So the Judith River Formation. 78 million years ago, this is what uh, North America looked like. Um, so if you look over to where Montana is, you can see there's a little bit of land and an awful lot of sea because the Western Interior Seaway split the continent into three. Um, the purple that you can see on this map of Montana is the Judith River Formation, and we work across the northern parts of that, uh, so uh, two or three different spots in that purple, and we've been collecting for a number of years. So this is kind of what, I think I've used this slide before, but this is what the Judith River looks like, and here we are prospecting, looking for new sites. So typically what we do is we follow up a bit on previous year's sites, um, dig big, big excavations that we've got permits for, and we prospect for new sites. We, start, we look for new things. So Jack's bone bed, the first big dig. So back in 2020, Jack Wilson found this site and there were lots of bits of bone sticking out. It's a very large sort of um, 100 feet or more wide uh, ancient channel sand. Uh, it's in the Judith River. And we went back in 2021 and we started to dig in. And then in 2022, we dug in some more. And this was a pretty big excavation. And we got about 240 bones out. Um, of all different kinds. We had bone, we had um, tyrannosaur bones, um, lots of duckbill bones, but in fact um, just about everything uh, we've had come out of this bed. Sometimes you get a bone bed and it's just one species. Um, in fact we have a bone bed that I'm not talking about this this week, uh, this year, um, called the bighorn bone bed, which is basically just one species. Whereas Jack's bone bed here, this one is lots of different species. So in 2023, we decided since this was such a good site, we were going to really go to town on the overburden. And we spent two and a half, three weeks clearing overburden off the top of the site. Uh, so go bigger or go home. It was big last year, but it was even bigger this year. Um, and it was a lot of work. And we had some really dedicated, hardworking people digging there. And uh, just on the right hand side of that picture, you can see a little surprise that was waiting for us one morning. We went down. We usually leave the shovels there instead of carrying them all the way back to camp. And uh, we lifted up one of the shovels and sat underneath was this little rattlesnake. 
Uh, so we, uh, it was very fortunate it was already on the end of the shovel. So we very gently picked up the shovel and walked up down the coulee with it. And, uh, and it eventually slithered off and we chased it away and stamped our feet a lot to make it go even further. But something you always got to look out for at these sites is uh, rattlesnakes. Because we had mice at this site too and the rattlesnakes love the mice. So uh, every time you lift a tarp off the site in the morning, you have to check for snakes and mice. So uh, this year... Um, I have a few photographs of bones in the ground. Um, there's a lot of brown on brown, I always say. It's quite difficult to see what you're looking at, but we had a lot of large duckbill limb bones um, at the site. And so here we have a couple of, uh, I think, tibiae, uh, so shin bones of duckbills. Um, this is a photograph of Liz and Danny and uh, um, jacketing some of these really huge limb bones. Um, we, we've got a lot of these. Um, from this site now and we've got one being cleaned up in the lab right now that we'll probably have a look at later on in the live section. Now this is quite interesting. This is on one of those limb bones. You can see quite clearly there's three parallel um, grooves uh, just below the brush there. Um, should have put an arrow on this slide but there you go I didn't. Um, so those are tooth marks. They're tooth marks from a uh, tyrannosaur and in fact we find quite a lot of tooth marks on the dinosaur bones that we collect in the Judith River. Um, pretty much all of them we can attribute uh, likely to be from tyrannosaurs. Um, so they're, they're pretty cool when we find them. So we always check uh, very carefully the bones, especially after they've been cleaned, um, to see if there's any tooth marks. And we have a few people who are very interested in working on uh, some of these that we've collected. So yeah, most of the large bones that we find are from duckbills, and specifically, we think most of them are from these lambiosaurines. So these are the duckbills that have big crests on top of their heads. Um, we also have very small bones from this site from duckbills. I've shown a few in previous years. Um, these are almost hatchling size. They're very, very small babies. Um, so again, everything from this site. Now towards the end of when we were digging there, um, we were moving some of the big limb bones that had been extracted and we came across this. And this is part of a jaw. It's part of a, a maxilla, an upper jaw actually, um, of uh, a duckbill. So, I believe. Um, so we're really excited because um, it means we have, we had multiple limb bones and parts of the pelvis, probably all from the same large uh, hadrosaur individual. And then, there was a skull bone with it. So we're very hopeful that actually this is the single individual and maybe there'll be a partial skull there. The limb bones are cool, but the skull can really tell you what you're looking at. So some other things that come from that site. This is a beautiful little crocodile brain case uh, that came from the, the bed this year. Um, we're gonna have somebody look at that fairly soon. Um, this is a tiny little theropod, a little raptor claw um, that came out of one of those gravelly beds. I talked about those a bit last year. Um, this, originally we thought this was possibly a parietal from a raptor dinosaur because it was covered in a lot of sediment. And when you find these things in the field, you don't dig them out, you don't expose them very much. Uh, you try and leave them in a block of rock as big as possible so it can be uh, cleaned up properly in the lab. So we sent this back to the lab and it was cleaned up and I was dead excited about it being a raptor. Um, brain case, and it turned out to be a complete turtle skull. So there you go. Uh, field identifications are not always all that great. Um, but it's a beautiful little skull, and this is now being studied in Arizona um, by some of our colleagues down there. So yeah, I said I thought it was from a raptor. Well, I thought it was from one of these, these are raptors called truodontids. And if you watched our um, stream last year, you'll remember that we got um, a whole load of bones coming out of this site from a truodontid. We have the shoulder blade, we've got some limb bones, we've got neck bones, back bones, part of the skull, um, parts of the hands. It's quite amazing how much we've got. And um, this is totally scattered through the site. There's no, no predictability about where these bones are gonna turn up, but, um, but we, we keep finding them. Anytime we see a very fragile piece of black bone, uh, we're very careful around it. So we found a few more this year. I've got some that are clean. Uh, Deanna's cleaned these. So this is a metatarsal three. I'm not 100% confident that this is from the Truodontid, but it's about the right size. Um, it might be from something like an Oviraptorid 
uh, a scene in Aphid, I should say. Um, but it is metatarsal three, so it's the middle um, of the toes on the foot. And then we've also got another neck vertebra. This is actually the third neck vertebra that we've collected now of the Truodontid. And this year we got the coracoid. And I thought, oh great, now we've got a scapular coracoid. We've got the set, right? We've got the whole shoulder. Well, I just went into collections and I, I tried to stick them together. And the coracoid is from the opposite side to the scapula. So that's quite promising because it means that both left and right scap coracoids may have been originally present from this skeleton. Um, so this is a little diagram showing what we've collected so far. Doesn't look like we've got all that much, um, which we haven't, but they're very rare, these raptors. You don't get very many associated skeletons. And what's quite exciting about this one is that we've actually got parts of the whole body. We've got one, we've got one bone, maybe two bones from the skull. We've got three vertebrae from the neck. We've got the shoulder, parts of the arm, and one of the finger bones. We've got a bone from the middle of the back and a big rib. We've got parts of the feet, and we've got even a, a vertebra from the tail. So all the parts of the skeleton of this of this animal are, or at least were originally, at that site. So as we dig in further, there's great potential for us to find more of this thing. Um, so yeah, Jack's bone bed, part two, the Lambiosaur. So if you remember, probably from last year's stream or the year before, um, on the other side of this site, um, we found a jaw coming out of a duckbill, and we dug in, and there was another jaw behind it. We dug a little bit further, and we uncovered this, which looks pretty cool, but it looks cooler when you do this to it. So this is the other side of that skull, all cleaned up in our lab, and this tells us that we've got a Lambiosaurus. So this is Liberty, the, the Lambiosaurus. This is the only specimen of Lambiosaurus from the United States. All the others are Canadian, and uh, it's one of the most complete known skulls. And there's a partial skeleton of this thing that we've been digging up over the last few years. Um, so we went back this year and we did a bit more digging at that site. Um, we took the cliff back some more. Um, what did we find? Well, Hannah was digging there and she says to me, oh, what's this? And she hands me this little piece of rock and it's there on the left hand side. And I said, oh. What's the other side look like? So I thought, just glancing at it, that it was the impression of um, a turtle shell. So I thought, oh, there must be a nice bit of turtle under there. Um, but I went over and there wasn't. There's just more of these impressions of little bumps and, and uh, pimples. And this is skin. This is um, skin of this Lambiosaurus. And what's quite interesting about Lambiosaur skin um, we often lump these duck bills together, all these, these uh, plant eaters that have these big wide duck bills. Um, but a cool difference between these two different groups of duck bills, there's lambiosaurines and there's hadrosaurines. Lambiosaurines have these big tall crests on the head, um, which are quite wild looking. Um, and hadrosaurines tend to have uh, more subtle crests on the nose or little crests sticking backwards. Uh, there's a, there's a, they, they do have very different looking skulls, but um, it's quite cool that the skin is different too. Um, hadrosaurines have quite large scales over the skin, whereas all the skin that's ever been found of lambiosaurines has been full of these little tiny pebbly scales, almost like warty skin of a toad. That's what I thought when I saw it, uh, for reasons you'll see later. Um, and usually with skin, you find it in patches. So we, well, we, we dug very carefully around this um, skin is great, but it makes digging difficult. So I was, uh, this is a very difficult site to photograph because there's lots of things going on. But what you can see in this photograph is a bunch of ribs. Those are actually the back end of the rib cage. Uh, just out of sight, you, there is a scapula, a shoulder blade, and more ribs. And that's actually where the first piece of skin came from. But on the right-hand side of this photograph, there's orange blotchy patches on the sediment, and that's more skin. So it looks actually based on this, that there is skin going all the way from the shoulder to the hips. Um, the hips and part of the femur is just towards the back of this photograph. Unfortunately, the area around the hip socket has been destroyed by um, a sinkhole, so where water has flowed through the rock, um, it's destroyed the head of the femur. Um, but what's cool is the femur goes down and articulates at the knee with the tibia, and that articulates down 
at an ankle, and that's as far as we got. And there's skin all the way down that leg. Or at least there's an orange horizon that looks like it should be skin. There's definitely skin at the top. We haven't dug into it and, you know, you don't expose it unless you need to. So it's made this site really complicated to dig because it was already difficult because it was big blocks. And now it's big blocks with skin in places. Um, but we've got a few here at the museum and um, it's really exciting. I was going to, you know, when we found this and when we'd be digging up, I, I thought this is one we can put on display like standing up, you know, maybe mount it as a skeleton or at least put it as a wall mount. But now it's turned into a mummy. Uh, it's going to be more complicated to put on display, but we will do it. Uh, it's going to be really cool. So Liberty just keeps giving us more, uh, more exciting things. Oh, and um, as if that wasn't fun enough, um, when we were digging up the skull, we couldn't see the neck when we were digging it up. And actually, because one of the hip bones is actually lying on top of the skull. Um, so um, the neck was removed slightly separately, but it has an articulated neck coming out the back of the skull. So that's one of the things that's been cleaned up this year. Uh, Anne-Marie did a little bit of it, and, uh, and then the rest of it was finished by uh, Deanna recently. So there is the skull of Liberty uh, with the articulated neck as it would have been upside down in the ground. Um, there's a few more neck vertebrae I believe and then we've got shoulder blades and arms and things to clean up from this thing too so it's just going to be a fabulous fabulous um, specimen um, Steve's working on that skull right now so we'll hopefully get that out um, flip it before Christmas clean up the other side and get it on display in time for next summer oh and uh, Liberty the Lambiosaurus is the start of our new lactation pod so if you come into the museum you'll see we now have a lactation pod available for use and uh, we thought we should give it a proper, a proper uh, design. So uh, Andrea Tuchin has done us this fabulous um, painting of Liberty. Um, and uh, you can see the little baby Lambiosaur at the bottom there. That's because from the same bed, we've got baby Lambiosaur bones. So this is supposed to show a, a mother and one of her brood, uh, which we thought was appropriate. And uh, the lactation pod was co-sponsored by City of Dickinson, um, the hospital here in Dickinson, and uh, Desti and Craig at uh, Wolf. So, something to see. It's a be beautiful piece of art, and it's huge, huge, too. We'll, we'll, we'll use that, and you'll be able to buy postcards and things like that, too. So, Jack's Bone Bed is a super site with tons of stuff coming out. Um, but, of course, we didn't just work that one site. I think I'm only barely a quarter of the way through my slides. Um, we also prospect for a lot of new sites and new things to find. So um, me and Andy, there's Andy Heckett there on the left. Um, he wanted to see some rock. Uh, so I was taking him down the coolie, showing him some of the sites that we were looking at um, and looking for new things. And we looked at one of these microsites and we were wandering along from there. And we were standing on top of this hill and we were both looking down and we saw this rounded blob. And it was like, is that what we think it is? And he's like looking at me and I'm looking at him. And, you know, when you see a rounded knob like that, you think it could be a skull of a pachycephalosaur or it could just be the head of a femur. And I've, I've, I've thought I found them before and it's been a head of a femur. Um, but we dug around and lo and behold, it was the dome from a little pachycephalosaur, a beautiful, perfect little dome. Um, so it's actually from a, a pachycephalosaur called Theraminocephaly. I don't know how many of these have ever been found in the U.S. There's a few of them been found in Canada, and they were named fairly recently. Um, so we actually got a, a young pachycephalosaur skull from the same coolie here um, a few years ago. We've been collecting pieces of that ever since. It's, it's quite a lot smaller than this, but that's a stegosaurus. This one's foraminocephaly. So it, it increases the number of species that we've, that we've collected from this area. Um, in the top left corner, you can see... Um, you can see the little foil coating that we gave it, um, and you can see two pieces of rock. On the top left is the the dome itself, and the bottom right is actually the piece of sediment that was underneath the dome with a little bit of concreted sediment in it. That orange blob is actually a cast, a natural cast of the brain cavity. Uh, so that's basically a natural cast of the brain of this dinosaur. Um, so that's quite cool. We collected that to go with it. Um, we also prospected a little bit in the Hell Creek. So here's Steve digging up a Triceratops maxilla. So this is an upper jaw of a Triceratops. Um, 
this is what it looked like cleaned up. Um, I think Wes cleaned this one up. I might be wrong. Um, but um, yeah, what's cool about this is it's got a little injury. Um, you can't really see it from the le on the left-hand picture. That's all those grooves are the tooth sockets. That's the inside view of the, of the jaw. On the right-hand side, that's the jaw seen from uh, the lateral, the outside of the skull. And it's got like a bulge and a bump on the bottom part of the, of the, of the jaw. Um, so maybe that was a tooth abscess. Uh, maybe it just got a bash. Maybe someone bashed it in the face. Um, but it's quite cool. It's got a very mild pathology there on the jaw. Uh, so we were quite excited to see that. And anytime you find an injury on a bone, it can tell you quite a bit about how the animal lived its life. Um, so it's really cool when you find that. That was a nice surprise. Uh, oh, here's the mandatory Tyrannosaur tooth slide. So um, the Judith is pretty rich for Tyrannosaur teeth. We're back in the Judith now. We're in the Hell Creek briefly. Um, so these are all teeth that were found this year. Um, we find a dozen or two dozen at least teeth every year. Sometimes we dig them up from the sites. Other times we find them lying on the surface at microsites. Um, this is quite cool. This is the bonus Tyrannosaur tooth slide. I don't remember which site this is from actually, um, but it's a nice tooth. The tip is missing, but it's a nice tooth, but it's completely hollow. Now, when Tyrannosaurs, like all dinosaurs, or most dinosaurs that have teeth anyway, um, they shed their teeth throughout their life, so they have many, many sets of teeth. And when they're about to shed a tooth, they absorb the root. So the root of the tooth is absorbed completely away, and then the tooth falls out, a bit like your baby teeth. But this one seems to have gone kind of overboard on that and, and has absorbed all of the dentine that goes up inside the tooth, maybe. Um, I don't really know. Uh, I've never seen a Tyrannosaur tooth this hollow before. It's literally like, I don't know, three or four millimeters thick, and then it goes all the way, all the way up. It's like, a, like an ice cream cone. Up, like. Very interesting. Um, I'm not showing this to anyone. This is a new thing. So it um, be interesting to see if anyone has any ideas about it. Okay, Deanna's baby site. So um, last year, um, Deanna had brought me one of these little bones and asked me what it was. And I said, that is a baby duckbill, um, the vertebra. Go back and find some more. So she went back and she actually did find some more. You know, we, we find like one or two of these things sometimes at microsites, um, but to find a whole bunch of them together is much more exciting. Uh, and we also found dinosaur eggshell at that site. So these are some slides from last year. So we got a whole bunch of embryo bones from this area and some eggshell. So this year we got uh, a permit to do an excavation there and um, see what there was. So um, Deanna and Steve took a small team down there and spent a couple of weeks um, looking to see if they can find where this stuff is coming out. And of course they did find where it was coming out and they did some digging to see what they could find. Um, so this is something that Steve found. Um, this is the cross section of an egg uh, in the cliff as it was found. In itself, that's kind of interesting. There's one thing that we didn't really get from this site. It's complete eggs. They're all slightly smushed or broken. So maybe they were hatched or in the process of hatching. I don't know. Um, there's still a lot of work to do at this site, but um, we have eggshell coming out over a number of different spots. Um, this is another egg, so you can see the rounded surface of the egg and the eggshell. Um, it has a pimply surface, so we think that it's hadrosaur eggs, although we haven't found any bones actually with the eggs. All the embryo bones that we found were loose, and all the embryo bones we found were from baby duckbills. So, um, so we're not totally confident these are duckbill eggs, but we're fairly sure they probably are. Um, this actually is an egg. I've posted some other photographs of it. Um, we've prepped this now, but this is a smushed egg. So it would have probably have been a whole egg, but it's been squashed. And what's kind of interesting about it is the orangey colored stuff that you can see. We see it actually quite a lot in all of the eggshell at the site, or a lot of the eggshell at the site. And <clears throat> it's only preserved on the inside layer of the egg. It's not on the outside, it's on the inside. So you get the pimply eggshell of the outside and then this orangey stuff is on the inside. So I'm wondering if it might be a um, preserved membrane. 
or something like that, something from the inside of the egg. It, it may not necessarily be well preserved. It might be just that um, soft tissues inside the egg caused a mineral to precipitate um, on that side of the eggshell. But either way, it's very exciting. And um, we're going to have this looked at with some um, X-ray machines and things, um, hopefully in the next month or so. Um, see if we can find out a bit more about it. But uh, it's pretty unusual. Now, this is something that Steve was quite excited about. Uh, I hadn't seen it, actually. Um, I wasn't digging at this site. But uh, what is this? This is like a blob in the cliff, right? Well, there it is, looking a bit less blobby. Um, um, this is actually a burrow, we think. Um, it's got a branching structure, but it doesn't look like an infilled root trace because it's parallel to the bedding. And there are there are little structures. I think my mouse will work. There are little, um, you can see vertical columns that connect some of these horizontal branches. So it seems consistent with the burrow and it's got what looks like might be scratch marks um, preserved on the inside. Um, so obviously it's an infilled burrow, obviously. It's not a hollow tube. It's been infilled with a harder sediment uh, or it's concreted that way, which has been good for us in terms of its preservation. What's interesting here is that many of these um, these egg sites, um, they're in what we think of as relatively well-drained areas. If you think about <clears throat> where you might choose to lay your eggs as a dinosaur, you wouldn't want to lay them in a swamp where they're gonna get surrounded with water because they'll, they'll drown, the embryos will die. So these areas where we tend to get nesting sites tend to be a little bit inland or upland. Um, with well-drained, well-formed soil horizons. And if you've got a well-drained, well-formed soil, um, those are also places where other animals live and you can burrow into them because they don't flood. So it's quite interesting that um, it's not just, this is a very small burrow, so it may be something like a mammal, a lizard, or something like that. Um, but we're finding dinosaurs in burrows now uh, all over the world. Um, that's something that uh, if you come to our museum, maybe I'll show you some of our stuff that we've collected that we think are dinosaur burrows. Um, um, but they're always from these well-drained environments, these inland environments, places where you're not going to get flooded and drowned if you live in a burrow. The next site is Rod's Duck. Um, so this was named after Rod Olson, who found it, uh, who passed away last year. Um, Back in 2022, we he found it in 2021 and we dug it in 2022. This is part of the tail. And if you saw the, the uh, presentation last year, you'll have seen this, this slide. So this is what there was. It's actually most of the most of a duck bill that's quite small. It's a young Brachylophosaurus here in the Judith River. So on the right hand side of the site is the articulated tail, a hind limb that's mostly articulated, and then you work your way along and you've got a rib cage and all the back. And then just as you're getting close to the skull, it all goes to pot and the thing gets disarticulated. Um, no neck. And a scattering of leg bones. So it looks like maybe there was a, it was preserved in a river in a channel sandstone. So maybe there was a flow taking bones towards the left of this picture. Uh, which is north, I think. Um, so what we did is we went back this year and we dug a little bit further to the left in this picture to see if we were lucky and we'd find the skull. So Liz led this dig and there were some more bones that were found. There's a rib there you can see on the left-hand side. Um, there are some other bones. I think there was like four or five. Um, but they dug a very big hole and didn't get an awful lot out of it. Um, so we think that site is closed now. Um, no sign of the skull unfortunately. Um, but some of those bones that we collected in 2022 have now been cleaned up in the lab. So here on the left you can see um, what is a complete um, arm. Uh, we actually have the other parts of the forearm to go with it, but there Steve had arranged it uh, for when Rod's family visited actually. Um, and then on the right hand side you can see um, parts of the feet and the lower leg and some ribs and other bones as well. And they're beautifully preserved. The sandstone's very soft and very easy to clean. So um, there are lots of um, nice bones from this spot. Um, one of the things that, 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 that's happened, um, um, Rod collected an awful lot of fossils and he collected a lot of nice things or a few nice things um, from the Judith River. And in spring of this year, um, his son Brent, you can see in the picture there, brought um, Rod's collection over 
and donated it to Dickinson Museum. Um, and there's some cool stuff in there. Um, I know that uh, some people are very excited to come here and see um, some of the specimens that uh, Rod collected. Um, I'll show you this one uh, because I have photographs of it. It's pretty cool. So this is the end of a metatarsal of a tyrannosaur from the Judith River. It's pretty big, so it's from a big tyrannosaur. Um, but, you know, bits of metatarsals, bits of tyrannosaur leg bones, you do find them every now and then. Uh, but what makes this one very interesting are these grooves and pits on the, um, on the bone. And these are tooth marks. These are tooth marks made by another tyrannosaur. So this is uh, more evidence of cannibalism in tyrannosaurs. Um, so this would have been another tyrannosaur that came along and uh, chewed on the toes of, of this one that Rod found. Now these pits don't show any signs of healing and um, they are across the articular end of the bone. So these would have been made long after the tyrannosaur was dead. So some tyrannosaur died and then another tyrannosaur came along and had a nibble on its toes. Uh, so that's quite cool. And that's just one of the cool specimens uh, that Rod collected, uh, which is going to be worked on here at Dickinson. So um, we have lots of other tyrannosaurs to talk about. So uh, here is the first one, Bertha, the biggest T-Rex, question mark. So um, Bertha is a new name we've given to a tyrannosaur that's been here in Dickinson for a long time. Um, the Dickinson Press article here is from November 1987, and this is from just when uh, Larry League had found it that summer. Uh, he's the former curator here at uh, Dickinson. Uh, well, it was called Dakota Dinosaur Museum then. Now it's Badlands Dinosaur Museum. And it's a leg. It's an associated leg. So it's a femur, a tibia, and a fibula. And it's very, very large. It's from the Hell Creek Formation near Marmoth in North Dakota. So this isn't Judith. This one's Hell Creek. It's a full-on T-Rex. Um, yeah, so Larry League found it. And it was on display um, for a number of years um, since about 1993. And um, I'll just go back to my previous slide. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because Steve um, basically tweeted fairly recently that this was the biggest T-Rex. Um, and I've probably mentioned that too. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Is it the biggest T-Rex? But I get like one or two emails a week asking me about Bertha and when we're going to say more about it and stuff. So this is for those people. I don't have that much more information, but there's some nice pictures and uh, some hints about what to expect to come. So yeah, it's been on display since 1993. And then um, in about 2017, I think, um, Dr. Holly Woodward, one of our um, former office mates, um, when me and Liz were both in Bozeman doing our PhDs, um, she's working on T-Rex growth, and she wanted to get a big collection of T-Rex bones to sample histologically. That means to cut them and look at how they grow. So that's actually something we can do with this leg. It's just a leg. You know, you can't tell very much about the animal because we don't have a skull, we don't have other bones. But the leg is the best, is the best part for doing histology. So we took this uh, tyrannosaur leg, we lifted it out of the pit, and we actually did a live three-hour video of us cutting this leg bone open, which you can still watch on Facebook if you're interested. You can go stream that. So here's Liz cutting a chunk. Uh, this one, she's cutting the tibia. Um, so she cut a section out the middle of the tibia. So you can already see some growth lines on it there in that cut section. And then uh, we don't just leave the bone in a few bits. That would be a bit disastrous. So we make a rubber mold and make a perfect copy of the section that was cut out. And then we glue it back in place. And then Liz very carefully uh, paints the pit that was glued back in place. And on the right hand side, you can see the cut section painted to match. Um, and it's very, very difficult. Anytime anyone comes into the museum, I tell them, all right, you got 10 seconds. Show me where the cut marks are. Show me the painted bit. And they're like, ah! And uh, sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. So Liz does an amazing job painting these things. Um, so you would never know that we'd cut a section out. Of course, that's really important for display. Um, so here's the sections. They were sent down to Holly in uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University. And here's those sections of uh, one of the bones um, getting ready to be ground really thin so that light will shine through them so they can be looked at under a microscope. 
Now, this isn't Bertha. This is just an example of what histology looks like. Um, these are slides from Liz's uh, PhD of a duck-billed dinosaur. And what we're looking at here are lines of, arrested, lines of arrested growth. So they're growth lines, a bit like the growth lines, the tree rings that you get, rings in trees. Dinosaurs have the same thing. They have rings inside of their bones, um, which form during the off-season. Um, for the animal. Now that's usually, you might imagine, the winter when food is hard to come by, but sometimes the summer is very dry and that might be the off season. Um, but regardless, they lay down a line every year. So if you can count the number of lines in your bone, you can see how old your dinosaur was when it died. So these aren't Bertha's histology slides, but Holly has created slides for Bertha and hopefully that data will be published in 2024. Um, <clears throat> In the meantime, we've been mounting the leg of Bertha. Um, so this is about to go in in January, uh, hopefully. We should be able to get this up. Um, Tom Krebs, local welder, came in and he's been helping us. Well, he, he built the, he built the uh, welded mount for Bertha's leg. Um, what's interesting, a few things about the size of Bertha then. Is it the biggest T-Rex? Well, first of all, this foot on the left is too small for the leg. Now, when Larry League had found this thing and he was putting together an exhibit in the early 1990s, he didn't have easy access to a complete foot. Um, so he purchased what he could. And so this one is a little bit small for what the leg should look like. Furthermore, the femur, as reconstructed, is too short. It's too small. So on the left in the brown, you can see the femur of Bertha. And on the right, not to scale, and I stress this is not to scale, is the femur of Sue. Now, if you look, um, there's like a little bump towards the bottom of the femur, and proportionally these are very similar, but basically um, the condyles, the articulating knee joint at the bottom of the femur, was not fully reconstructed um, by Larry um, when he modeled this on in plaster. Now, that's fair enough. There weren't many easy comparisons in 93. This was before Sue was published. You, if you wanted to know what a femur looked like, you basically had to already have one. Um, so they did what they could, but I suspect that Bertha's femur should be about two to six inches longer than it is reconstructed here. Now, length is not necessarily what is used to decide what is the biggest um, dinosaur, but I will say that Bertha's femur um, is about the same size as Sue and Scotty. It might be slightly bigger. Um, what we usually use to measure weight or the size of the animal is the girth of the femur. Ours is slightly crushed. Holly has been working on reconstructing it. Um, and she tells me that it is the, the, the largest and most mature specimen in her data set. Um, but her data set doesn't include Sue or Scotty. Um, so there's kind of a question mark there. But regardless, um, Bertha has all three leg bones completely cut through. So we have the histology of all three of the leg bones and it is the best known of the largest T-Rex. It's gonna tell us about T-Rex growth, how big they got, how fast they grew. Um, it's got a lot of information in there. It's gonna be the best known of those big Rexes. So that's um, something really cool. And hopefully, hopefully we'll maybe see that paper next year. I don't know, but um, there's a lot of other specimens in there, but um, really cool stuff. I will certainly have this exhibit up and Holly says I can put the histology uh, slide up there too. So there'll be more information in the exhibit when we get it up next year. Uh, Tyrannosaur 2 is Denver's Tyrannosaur. This is a quick update on the progress of that specimen. Um, you might remember that we had this big block with an articulated skeleton in it. Well, uh, we helicoptered it out in 2020, I think, 2021 maybe, 21 I think. Um, and this is what it looks like currently. So we've been working our way in. You can't really appreciate how much rock has been removed from this photograph, especially in the bottom left corner. There weren't any bones right there, but the rock has been removed. So we're progressing. Um, you can see an articulated tail. The rest of the tail is actually already clean and on display. And then underneath that tail, it's hard to see. Maybe my mouse pointer is showing, but there's actually an articulated neck underneath that tail, and that's curving towards the middle of the block. So that's why Steve is working towards that middle point. That's where we think the skull will be. We're going to clean the whole thing anyway, but we're chasing the skull to begin with, because why not? It looks nice. 
So that's currently being prepped in the lab and you can see through the window, you can see that big block. Tyrannosaur number three is Sisyphus. Now this is the one we described as a new species, Despletosaurus wilsoni, a year ago. And there's Andrea Tuchin's beautiful reconstruction of what we thought Sisyphus might have looked like based on the... Um, here's the skull of Sisyphus. Uh, looks very nice. Uh, look even nicer when we have the, the complete 3D restoration. Um, should be coming soon. Um, of course, beautiful jaws. But we've got more than just the skull. There is a limited amount of what we call the postcranium, so the bones after the skull. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been working on. We described the skull bones last year, and then we've been cleaning up the, the postcranium. And uh, Elias, my, my colleague, uh, who described these things is we're going to work on these next. So here's the sacrum. So these are the hip bones, the fused vertebrae that make up the hips. Um, so that one has just been cleaned up. Deanna did most of that, and uh, that's going to be on display soon. Here are some of the neck vertebrae. These are really beautiful. I think there's four of these. Uh, these two are gorgeous, uh, beautifully preserved neck vertebrae, really big when you compare them to mine. <laughs> um, and here are some two more neck vertebrae which are in the two of the few bones at this site that are in super hard rock. Um, so they're going to stay in the rock. We're going to clean it up a little bit more and then they'll be on display as well. And then we've got a few tail bones. There's a couple of tail vertebrae and then there's a chevron there on the right hand side. Uh, and just a reminder, if you like Sisyphus, the, we still sell these busts. Uh, we have a few different sizes. You need to email me or go to our website and you can find um, where to purchase those. Uh, Tyrannosaur 4, I think this is my last my, my last site, Jack's Tyranno. Um, so in 2017, uh, we found four Tyrannosaur sites, I think, in this area. Um, and this one was, was the least obvious or the least promising, maybe. Um, there were shattered bits of bone across the surface. And this one caught our eye. Um, it's the tip of the snout of a Tyrannosaur. This is a premaxilla. So it's the tooth bearing part right at the tip. If you're a human, that's where your incisors are. Um, and there were other just shattered bits of bone lying over the surface. Um, so we collected all these fragments and we could see where actually where one or two of them had come out of the cliff. So there was promise that we could dig there. Um, I managed to get some of the pieces together. So um, this is actually a lacrimal. This is one of the bones over the eye. It's made of many, many chunks that we've glued together. Um, and we've done a pretty good job of getting more of these chunks together since. So the lacrimal is important because it's one of those bones that's diagnostic for tyrannosaurs. It can tell you what species you have, or at least in combination with other diagnostic bones. Um, so last year, Steve led a crew, went back there, did um, a medium sized dig, I shall say. Uh, we spent a couple of days doing overburden and then I think a week digging. And we found one bone, but it was the post orbital which is basically the best bone you can find of a Tyrannosaur, uh, if you're going to just find one bone. So it was promising. It took a lot of work, but we got one bone. So we went back in 2023 and did a bit more work. And uh, you can see in this photograph, you can see the Danes. We had a, a couple visit from Denmark um, who worked at this site exclusively. And uh, they had such a good time that they got the, they got the group calling this animal Holger who's a Danish folk hero, sort of semi-mythological folk hero. So the name of this specimen is now Holger. Um, so they were excavating, and every now and then they came across a bone. And they kind of look like this. This actually is part of the skull, believe it or not. Um, most of the bones at this site are broken up. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, but everything we got was skull. Um, what are these little spikes? This is another bone that was found at that site. Well, this is actually the top of the nose. It's the nasals of this Tyrannosaur. So this is what was found of Holger. And we haven't finished at the site yet. We've still got plenty to dig. So we're hoping that we'll find more. Uh, but it's already a really good, um, already a really good proportion of the skull that we're gonna get this skull reconstructed as well, probably in a year or so um, when we know how much more of it we've got. So very promising. Um, it's a little bit smaller than Sisyphus. It's a little bit younger. It's got some indications of that in its bones as well. Um, so a really interesting specimen. We actually have parts of both uh, upper jaws, tip of the snout, um, 
quite a lot of the skull bounds. It's, it's actually a surprisingly good site. So watch this space in 2024. Um, we're hoping we'll have more of this thing to show next year. So another Tyrannosaur for Dickinson. So that's, I think, the fourth one I talked about today. Uh, lots of Tyrannosaurs. Um, I always like to end these talks with um, pictures of the animals. And uh, it was the year of the toad this year. There was a, it was a very wet spring. And there were lots of grasshoppers and the toads really took advantage of that. And there were times when we had crew walking in front of the vehicles, chasing all the toads out of the road. This is a photograph of our camp at night. There were 30 toads in that left-hand picture and you can see them all crammed together. And uh, they were such cute little guys. We had a great time um, watching them at night, hopping about, eating bugs. Um, but we saw lots of other animals too. We had a cool salamander turn up at one site and... Uh, in case you're wondering, that top right photograph of us of all the uh, feral rabbits that live in Haver. If you go to the McDonald's in Haver, it's like a children's petting zoo. There's all these little bunnies hopping around the grass there, uh, all the way along there, actually. There's dozens and dozens of them. They're, they're pretty cute. Um, so just some final slides. Um, and then we'll go to our live section, of course. Well, this is live, but, you know, you, you'll get to see me or you. Um, so, yeah, so you can become a museum member. You get a discount in the shop. Uh, please become a member if you live local. You might want to come in more than once uh, a year and, uh, yeah, come and see some of the new things. Um, and also remember, we have volunteers here in the lab. We've even had volunteers in the summer in the lab, actually, the last couple of years. And uh, the fieldwork program, I'm starting to get um, volunteer applications in for that as well. So uh, take a look at the website, email me. Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, we have tons of great volunteers. It's been such a good year, it really has. Um, and uh, they really help us get us all this stuff out. Uh, and again, please consider donating. Uh, your donations do make a difference to our program. And otherwise, thank you so much to um, all of our donors, uh, the fossil preparation team in the lab, and then a really large number of people in our field crews. Um, and then for land access, um, the three state, uh, the the three public land uh, land administrative groups that we work with: the state of Montana, Bureau of Reclamation, and the Bureau of Land Management. And of course, thanks also to many of the private landowners who allow us just to drive across their land to access some of this public land. It's really important. And at that point, we will switch over to our live uh, camera. To the lab. Yep, this is the lab. This is the lab. This is where everything happens. This is Steve's domain. This, this is Steve Lawson. Uh, yes, I am the lab manager here at Batman's Dinosaur Museum. Uh, we're hoping to give you kind of a full tour of what's going on in the lab, and then we'll work our way into collections and see stuff that's uh, been prepared this summer okay. and in the spring. Oh, do you want to start? Pointing things out, I can name the camera. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's go right here. This was a topic in the presentation. So Sisyphus, post crania, they are all done except for this block. This block has two of Sisyphus's cervical vertebrae. Once again, Sisyphus, our holotype, Displetosaurus wilsoni. This has a little more work to go. There's still some matrix on these bones, but we're going to leave them in the rock kind of using the rock as a pedestal, and it'll be a nice uh, museum piece for display. I want to turn the camera to uh, this microscope here, because I'm really excited about all the new microscopes we've gotten. Um, microscopes are key to really, really good, thorough, detailed fossil prep, and uh, once uh, I find that once you get a volunteer on a scope, they don't want to stop using it. So it's, it's good that uh, we are fully populated with scopes, so nobody has to fight over them anymore. Um, right here, there's some micro fossils from Jack's bone bed in prep. These were taken out of a jacket just today. Yeah. You know, the action continues every single day. So, let's move over to this. This is sort of the star of the show in our viewing window right now. So, we have a viewing lab. If you visit the museum, you can come back and uh, see all of the action happening. Um, we hide almost nothing, or at least we don't intend to hide anything. Um, our volunteer, Wes, who's also a 
student with Liz at uh, Dickinson State has been working on this femur and he's doing really well for a uh, first project. A little bit louder, it says. A little bit louder? Yeah. Steve doesn't okay. speak very loud. He's not like me. <laughs> he's a quiet, gentle giant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is, that is the thing, because the microphone's facing the other way, I think, with this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Wes is doing a great job. This is one of the femurs removed this year from Jack's bone bed, and that was touched on in the presentation. I wanted to give Liz the chance to say a little bit more about... Yeah, this you can femur. try to lift up yeah. the camera and get more of a whole view of the femur. Uh, so this is a, a hadrosaur femur, duckbill dinosaur, uh, from the other side of Jack's bone bed. So it's not from the Liberty Lambiosaurus. We think it's a second individual. Uh, so we have both legs of this one. So this is the bottom part of the femur here. This is the knee joint down here. There's the condyles. And then the head of the femur is, is up here still in the rocks. This is the upper part where the hip goes. And then down the middle, we have a lot of places where muscles attach. So the main one, you probably can't see because it's all the way on the back, but I'm touching it right now. Don't worry about it. But that is where a big muscle attaches to pull the leg back and help them walk. But we know there's other muscle attachments too. This area right here has a weird texture to it. Um, you can see how the rest of the bone is very smooth. And then this is strange kind of elongate bumps. And so that rugosity there, that roughness, represents a very strong muscle attachment point. We also have a beautiful hole right here. Beautiful, perfect little hole. And you might think, oh, it's just shaped just like a Tyrannosaur tooth. No, it's not a bite mark. Uh, this is natural. All bones have them. So this is called a nutrient foramen. And this is where the blood vessel enters the bone. Uh, there's a couple of different spots where they do it, but pretty much all long bones in your body have one major hole uh, somewhere on the shaft of the bone that is the main supply of blood for the bone. And your bones are what make your blood, your red blood cells, your white blood cells. It's all produced inside the bone marrow. So that's why we need a really good blood supply uh, on all the bones, especially something this large. This is a big duck bill. Uh, it's, it's a good size. Yeah, definitely for what it is, for sure. Yeah. Happy to get these big limb bones cleaned up. This one's almost done, and we have another one ready to go right after it. Yeah, we both both femur are lying uh, right next to each other, and then we've got the rest of the legs and arms as well. So what we're hoping is that next summer when we go into the hill, we hopefully are working our way towards the pelvis and the rest of the vertebrae. And then if we're really lucky, skull on the end, but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Uh, but it's just really cool that this bone bed is now has two associated Lambiosaurus individuals and all of the other cool, tiny little things that we're finding. Uh, so Speaking let's, of tiny things, we're let's back switch to over on this. Yeah. So uh, this is another project I'm working on. This is cracked open less than a month ago, mind you. Um, this was found, I believe, in 2018 and taken out in 2019 by uh, Denver and uh, Jack Wilson. So this is a, most of a skeleton sans skull head, unfortunately, of a champsosaur from the uh, Judith River. This is from our uh, uh, work area in Hinsdale, near Hinsdale. Um, it has a neck as well. The neck vertebrae were collected in the field. What you're looking at um, I don't know how well you can see this. All of these um, parallel tubes here. This is a, a gastral basket. So this animal is uh, being prepped from the underside. So this is his, his belly, essentially. And just to the left of that, you have an articulated arm. So you see uh, the radius and the ulna and then all of the uh, fingers there. I am still exposing the fingers. It's very slow. Work. You have to do it under a scope, one of our new scopes, um, using uh, hand tools. And one of the coolest parts about this is that there's, there's skin. Um, it's probably difficult to see on camera, but most patches that you see uh, that are orange here, there are some scales, and under a scope you can see them uh, much better. And then there are some rough patches here that sort of hint at skin. And I like the, this sort of sawtooth pattern on the edge here. So these are the 
the edges of the scales here. So this is cracked open recently. This is going to have the rest of the body, at least one leg and a tail going all the way back here. It's a very, very uh, fun shaped jacket. You can see exactly what's going on. It's a cute little thing. It's uh, Steve opened, he didn't tell you, he opened this because um, because he wanted something to work on with the microscopes and like training people, well training novices, but, uh, yeah. but so people could like work on something cool under the scope and then it had skin and it needs Steve's attention. So uh, it's, a, it's a complicated animal, but um, it's, it's a cute little thing. It was, I'd say it was fun to find, but uh, I, every, when I was digging this up, I was like, why couldn't this be a dinosaur? It's this beautiful articulated skeleton. I'm like, why? Every inch of it was like, this could have been a baby Rex or something like that. But, uh, but you know, some people love Champsosaurus, so that's okay. Champsosaurus are awesome. Like, they, they look like <laughs> aerial crocodiles, but they're, they're not. They're this whole other weird kind of reptile. But they look like crocodiles. I think they're very cool. Well, no matter what, I think it's cute. One day you will see it on display. We've talked about 3D printing uh, a skull. There are other Champsosaurs out there, and there are some good 3D models of skulls we could scale to this and put the neck on and kind of make it, kind of make it awesome. I think he's really fun. But that's just me. So where to next? Do you want to look at the Lambiosaur? Oh, uh, that's a good idea. So here we are at the back of the lab. I know you can hear a little bit better when the microphone is... Hey look, it's like having a selfie stick. What could possibly go wrong? Um, yeah, so this is the Lambiosaur skull. Steve has been working on cutting away the jacket at the back here. Right here. Yeah, this was just opened up recently. What I'm trying to do is reduce the size of this jacket, the jacket that's still around the skull, that's going to make it easier to make a cradle for the skull so I could flip it and then uh, work on the other side. We are going to get this through a CT scanner soon, and the CT scanner only has a certain uh, radius that it can accommodate, so I'm trying to make a cradle as tight as possible. And right here, you see a bit of that hip that Denver was talking about. Part of its uh, hip floated on top of the skull, and that's the ilium there. The skull is flipped over here, so this is the part of the animal's head that was lying in the sediment before it was buried. Always the better side, uh, pr preservationally. The neck is right here. There are at least, well, there are about four neck vertebrae here. With some parallel tendons, I'm not sure are associated, but uh, there are one, two, three, four ribs as well. Pretty cool. So you want to look at Holga? <laughs> <laughs> so here's some parts of Holger. Um, this is the fourth Tyrannosaur, if you like, the one that we talked about at the very end. Um, so when these were being found, I was told, like, oh, we've got a splenial, oh, we've got a denary. Turns out it was mostly a maxilla that had broken up into multiple pieces. Um, but, but there are lots of other bones, as you saw, of this thing. Um, so these click actually together very nicely. Like these bits actually fit on. So these were found a couple meters apart. This is an ancient break. But, uh, it goes, it goes all the, the way up. Here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, there's the fit. So one day uh, we will have this sealed up and glued together, but we can't do that until we know that we don't have this piece. If I were to glue this now, that would lock out any potentials for gluing this piece in. And we actually have a lot of little sort of one and two inch chunks with large fr uh, foramina on them um, that are basically parts of the side there that you can see snapped away. So as those are cleaned up, we'll get a better idea of where they fit. And we actually have the same part, the anterior part, the front part of both maxillae. So both upper jaws are represented and both are actually broken up like this yeah. as well. So, um, but... It, this has far exceeded my expectation for the site. After last year when we got the uh, post-orbital, I was like, well, if we get one more cool bone like that, it'll be worth it. But we've turned up loads. Not easy to ID all of this stuff in the field either. <laughs> but there is a one tooth so far associated with Holger. It's, right now it's, it's protected in a, 
a coating here because I've been error braiding this specimen, but Holger does have at least one tooth. The rest uh, drifted away long ago. If I take this bit of maxilla here, you can see uh, where uh, the tooth rows were. You can say where the roots uh, were sitting in the alveoli and the uh, blood canals as well. So pretty cool. And these trays show more of Holger. But this is what was shattered on the surface uh, when it was found. So this is all very tight. There we go. It's a little easier. So this is this is the lacrimal that was put together from lots of little fragments. Um, it actually sits like this. So this is the midline, um, and then this is the little horn that sticks out over the eye. And if I hold it a little closer, maybe you can see the texture. It's actually really, really finely textured. Um, it's a really cool um, bone. And there's more of the lacrimal there. So this piece, which is in many fragments, is from the bottom of the lacrimal where it touches with the cheekbone. So there's probably a whole lacrimal originally was at this site, uh, but it's broken up. So we're hoping that we can get some more of it together. And the rest of what's in this drawer, or in this tray, is... Um, parts of the cheekbone, the jugal. So it'll go together, hopefully, maybe, depending on how well Danny works on it. Um, but she, she's been really good at getting, uh, at getting some of our other specimens together that are in many pieces. There could well be more of it uh, in the hill too. It's worth saying. So I wanted to walk over here, just give a pass. Uh, through Denver's Tirano here, which was touched on in Denver's talk. So there's the concretion, obviously. Everybody who's walked in lately has uh, been uh, looking at this bone. Uh, this is uh, fairly recently exposed. This is uh, an ilium. Uh, it's, it's drifted away from the rest of the hip a little bit. That would be over here. So this is where the base of the tail goes into the concretion. There was a naturally occurring fracture here that we took advantage of. We removed most of the tail in the field so we could accommodate the helicopter lift that uh, needed to happen. I think, what was it, about 10,000 pounds? Yes, 10,000 pounds. Yeah, with the steel beams we had to hike in. So there's the ilium there, and the crest of the ilium, uh, there is also this naturally occurring fracture that we took advantage of that's been prepared and it clicks on perfectly, perfectly. So this is going to be complete and beautiful. And here's the tip of the tail. So it curves around the body, then it goes in until you find the very, very last tail vertebra here, which is really cute. The neck, these are the ends of the uh, cervical ribs. The neck is curving in this way. So those ribs are sort of uh, joining up as they do. If you see uh, pictures of other epistotonic tyrannosaurs. So when I started uh, exposing all of these, that made me very happy. This is exactly what I was looking for. Um, it's the bottom of the neck you're looking at. So this is a bot the bottom of a, a <clears throat> cervical centrum. This is the bottom of another one. There's one hidden over there too. And then there's one obscured under here. And so that dives into the block, hopefully chasing the uh, skull. To show you the rest of what we have, I'll go over here. Our volunteer and board member, Destiny, has been working the block down to get to the uh, belly ribs, the gastralia, of which uh, you can see some poking out here. So that's the extent of... Uh, what we have so far. Our volunteer Danny is uh, working on this jacket from Jack's Bone Bed. This is a big Lambiosaurian humerus that was taken out last year and it is right beside an ulna. I believe that's an ulna. And Danny has also been taking out some very small bones from this area here which has a uh, clay pebble conglomerate that has a lot of micros in it, which is awesome. Uh, thoughts? Yeah.
Yeah, so you want to I can just take the camera. Yeah, let's take okay. a tour. Hey, what? Who is it? It's Bertha. <laughs> yeah, it's Bertha. Yeah. She's in my office because we were, we were using the bones to uh, make the mount, of course. That wasn't that long ago. It was uh, just, uh, just after the summer, I think. Was it after the summer or before the summer? After. After the summer. That's right, yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's... Uh, it's up there. It's a very big, heavy animal. Can you see where the cut marks are? <laughs> you see where the cut marks are? Uh, you didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome to Collections. We showed this last year, but since now it's current, you can look at that. There we have the one bone taken out of the Holger quarry in 2022, the post-orbital. And I'm always going to remember this bone because mm -hmm. I was sitting next to Elias, who's the lead researcher on this project, and I asked him, Elias, what's the one bone you want? Because we've been digging, finding nothing for two days. And he said, I would really like a post-orbital. Ten minutes later, I dug that up. And uh, most of it's there. It's just uh, missing a little bit there to a sinkhole. It's got this lovely horn on it. Great texture. That's Holger. The bones are beautifully preserved. It's just here and there you have bits and pieces of things. Ooh, that's a good one. This is the nasals of Holger. So I'll rotate them a little bit so you can see them in all their glory. Now, the cool thing about the nasals is, now it's broken off at this end, but we actually have the bit that fits there. Uh, yeah, I use it. It's currently being 3D scanned. So this piece would fit here. So if I turn it around, this is the nostril. Oh, my finger's moving. Um, so, and then the midline is here. So it's actually more or less almost a complete nasal if we mirrored this part. And of course there may be more parts of it to find. But what's cool about nasals is that in mature tyrannosaurs um, they're rough and pitted but in the slightly younger ones, say the subadults, they're actually quite pointy and spiky. Um, as you can see in this one too, they're, they're very spiky too. So um, Holger is a little bit younger than Sisyphus uh, it's also from a slightly different stratigraphic level, so we're not quite sure if the differences are, well, what, what to attribute them to. They could be stratigraphic, it could be that it's a different uh, chronological age, it could be that it's different on genetic age, it could be a different species. Um, so, there's the inside, you can see the sutures. Yeah, isn't that pretty? Yeah, it's pretty pretty. This specimen is brought to you by our new air abrasion setup. It's, uh... <laughs> It works wonders on these bones. So here's the post orbital again. It's just so pretty. Really well preserved. You should see the 3D scans of the post orbitals. They look really good too. Um, they're really impressive actually. What else we got? Is the crocodile? I can, well, let's do a little tease here. Yeah, there's the crocodile. <laughs> there's something else back there. <laughs> so this is that crocodile brain case from uh, Jack's bone bed. Um, really pretty. Where's the rest of its face? That would be a good question. <laughs> Maybe it's further in the cliff because this was fairly near the back of where we were digging um, this year. So maybe there'll be more of it. Um, we seem to find quite a lot of crocodile brain cases. We have another couple of them that yeah. are quite nice. Um, so there you go. This is all recently prepared stuff. So I mean, you know, some of these photographs are things that I've been posting. Uh, very, very recent. As, I don't know if we ever showed this. <clears throat> Joel, did you ever show this? I'm not sure. We may or may not have, but it's good for a rerun. This is a cool specimen. Steve can tell you about this because uh, he dug it up. But uh, Amanda found it. I should say that first. Yeah, Amanda found it. Um, this is uh, at or near our Bighorn Bone Bed uh, site in uh, near Hinsdale. So this is uh, Judith River again, a Ceratopsian lower jaw. Probably Centrosaurus. Uh, 
It's the best bone from the entire big horn bone bird. It's because, true. <laughs> because it's ceratopsian. <laughs> this this was just almost fully concreted. It was it took quite a while to get done. I'm 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 proud of how it came out. Uh, there's a lot of specialized techniques used uh, just to preserve the enamel on this guy, but I'm very happy Amanda found it because it gave me a, a challenge. One of the things that's really promising about this specimen is that all the teeth are there and intact. Like, um, if you remember before, um, we showed a picture of a Triceratops maxilla that Steve found, and we can show you that in a minute. Um, but that one, all the teeth have fallen out, and you can see all the slots where the tooth go. So that's been rattling around a river a while, and it's fallen apart. Because the teeth are in this, there's always potential for more of this skeleton. And this particular bed where these things are coming out, we have at least five individuals of Brachylophosaurus from this site. Um, this is, of course, a Centrosaurus. Uh, from the same site, but uh, or as a centrosaur, but they tend to be a bit scattered, so you sort of get them in the same sort of area of the bed, but they do the bones do move around a bit, um, so we might expect to find more of this at the site, um, just maybe you know three meters away. That kind of thing is typical there, so it'll take us a while to get to them, but I suspect there's going to be more. Uh, in fact, I know there's at least one more fragment because we found it, but it'd gone down the cliff you know, many years ago. Um, but there is more of this. Hopefully. It could even be from the same individual as the horn that we actually named the site after, the Big Horn Bone Bed. Um, although that was about 20 meters away. Yeah, Big Horn Bone Bed became a joke because we thought it was going to be a Ceratopsian bone bed based on the horn. And then it was just hundreds of duckbill bones. Uh, so that's a good specimen for us. I passed uh, this box by, and, and this is worth a mention. We're actively working on uh, Liberty's post crania. And so that's uh, pieces of uh, the ilium that uh, Diana's finished up. So that ilium will be pieced together soon. All of these things are happening active every single day. I can grab that Triceratops maxilla. Yep. So this is the maxilla of the Triceratops that I had it featured in the... Uh, I was going to say the video, the presentation. So maybe you can see a little bit better. You can certainly see it from above. If I just rotate it a little bit, you can see the bump here on the upper jaw. That's, a, that's a, an injury, a pathology in this guy. And you, can, you can also appreciate just how much bigger this is than, uh, than the centrosaur <laughs> that we just showed you the picture of, uh, that we just showed you the specimen. Especially of. when you see the tooth rows. Yeah, if I flip this around... So yeah, here are the tooth rows. So this would have also had a, a layer of bone covering up the tooth rows and all the teeth would have been in there. But this was bouncing around a river channel. It was kind of, um, yeah, it was in a sandstone. But uh, it's a nice bone, it's a good bone to have. It was a cool thing to find. It was only one day prospecting in the Hell Creek. We went to an area we haven't been to before. So, uh, so it was a good thing to find. We will go back there. Are there any requests? Uh, a couple of questions, yeah. Um, uh, Isaac wants to know, do you know what Bertha's minimum femur circumference is? <laughs> minimum femur circumference? Yes. <clears throat> the answer to that question is... is yes, yes we do. That's true. Uh, <laughs> well, we, I mean, we kind of do. I measured it, we know exactly Yes, what. but the, the... Yes, but you... It's crushed in. Not so, on the femur. No, it is. You can see it's crushed in. Like it, it's not as crushed in as the tibia is, but all of the all all of the bones apart from the fibula are, are crushed in a bit. So what actually has to happen is the cut section then has to have those broken pieces restored to give you the full circumference of the femur. And I know everyone's like, is it 63 inches or 64, or whatever it is that um, Sue and Scotty are supposed to be. I mean, it's definitely in that ballpark. Um, I can't actually measure the actual amount because all we can do is measure the broken outside of the bone. Only Holly has the precise data that she's pulled off of the reconstruction based on the slide that she made. So that kind of waits for that paper. Although, as you can see, we're a little excited about the... <laughs> That data point. But, really? People uh, are excited about big yeah. T-Rexes? I don't yeah. know what's, why. What's this T-Rex thing? Yeah. Um, 
People are also interested in pathologies. Do any of the Tyrannosaurs have pathologies? Mm. Oh, no, where's the... You should go back and see... Let's, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's take a visit once more. Holger. So here's that uh, piece of uh, Holger maxilla that we were uh, looking at before. This is the uh, anterior right maxilla. And you'll note this, this lesion here. It almost looks like a lesion. So um, the idea is at one point in time, there was a bite here and it healed, but uh, there weren't doctors in the Cretaceous, so they couldn't help you heal. And uh, it healed pretty badly. And there are other Tyrannosaur specimens known with bites in almost the same place. Um, so the front of the snout is kind of where they they were uh, biting each other, having little uh, having but little fights. Hol Holger's like really bad though. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like there there are marks in the same place in um, B2. It also has some marks across the maxilla. But this is I mean I know this is only like a 2D image, but like it's really quite raised here. Um, I can rotate it slightly. You can see a little bit. Yeah, maybe do it that way around. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. right here. It's uh, it's and it's got a really interesting, rough sort of texture to it as well. It's uh, it had a hell of a scar on its face. Yeah. Not on my Pathologies. Here's a failed 3D print that probably had a very similar injury. <laughs> <laughs> this one went wrong. So, uh... Yeah, we have so many Sisyphus busts walking around there. Uh, they're competing for territory. Irritator, how about that? So we do a lot of 3D printing, and Denver uh, has a post on Facebook about this. Just printed out the uh, Irritator model. Um... Do well, we have anything to, to pick up lots of good questions? Okay. Um, so speaking of Liberty Cass, uh, one of the people that helped us dig, uh, wanted to know how much of Liberty we got out this summer. It's been a multi-year project. Um, so Liberty, we have the skull, the neck, both shoulder blades, both humeri, um, full limb material, uh, probably an articulated arm. There are an awful lot of ribs like over the top of all the bones, so you're always sort of trying to find a way to get it out in a lump. Um, so, but then the, basically this animal died, it fell on its right hand side, the left hand side of the animal disarticulated, and in fact the vertebrae disarticulated too. But the, the right side of the rib cage, the shoulder blade, the arm, and the leg all stayed articulated in the ground, mostly. And so it's the right side just under that where we got the skin. So we've probably got an articulated rib cage, scapula, hip, leg on the right hand side, and the left hand side is disarticulated. Um, the tail is completely disarticulated and scattered all over the place. So there's tail vertebrae all over the place. This year we've, we've got as far as the mid torso. So the legs still basically just goes underneath into the cliff. So that's going to involve like 15 feet of overburden or something stupid. Maybe 10 feet. We've got more. Yeah. And we do also have um, pieces of the uh, hip that have drifted away. So we have an ilium, for example, that's on top of the skull. Just a question of how. I expect we won't get a full leg on the left hand side, but the right hand side, I'm actually quite hopeful. Maybe we'll get a foot, you know, an articulated foot with skin. I think that's actually likely. So um, it's super promising. How you, how you clean it up, how you collect it, and how we display it is gonna be a challenge. Uh, the skull is pretty easy because it just goes in a box, but everything else is gonna be quite a challenge to try and make it so that people can tell what they're looking at. Anything else? Can I ask a question? Sure. All right, skin question. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, this one comes from Drew, age 11. Uh, so did dinosaurs have skin or did they have scales? 
Do I really have slides? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Yes. Um, they have both. I mean, it's, it's like the lizard skin. Um, which, can I bounce this to our rex, reptile expert, Steve? Uh, <laughs> reptile husbandry expert. <laughs> It's both. It is skin, but there are roughened patches that are scales. And depending what kind of animal we're talking about, sometimes there's even bone under the skin. So there are some lizards that have little bits of bone under the skin. And there are some dinosaurs, like ankylosaurs, that have little bits of bone under the skin. The skin itself can have bumps. Do you call those bumps scales? Well, people can debate that a lot. That's well, then you might also ask them, like, anatomically, what do you mean by skin? So you have a dermis, so you have an epidermis, right. and where do those things fall in place? So scales are going to be the, the epi end of that. Right. In and terms of overlapping scales, like maybe a snake, no. But scales sitting next to each other in the skin, yes. All right, that was a great question. I say, I'm not, we're not hiding the skin from you. Um, I'll, it's just not clean yet. Yeah, it's not prepped yet, and we haven't really got it out because, um, you know, it's, you don't want to expose it to the air or anything. Like once Clint, Clint Boyd, who's the state paleontologist, he's, he's working on mummified hadrosaurs in, in Bismarck, um, and he's very interested in the preservation of skin. So I don't want to expose this stuff unless he's looked at it and says we're okay to do things. That's the problem with skin. It's like, if you put glue on it, you can change the way that it's interpreted and change the chemical signatures. So, but if you want to expose it, you have to put glue on it or you should. So we're basically keeping everything as, as hands off as possible. Right, so am I the skin's worst enemy as a fossil preparator? We, Denver and I have had discussions about the Champsosaur over there with the skin. It's like my instinct is to preserve this fossil to keep it from falling into oblivion and floating away as some bone actually does, some scales actually do. So I want to add this plastic, this consolidant to it, but then that can ruin your chemical analysis. So it's, we're, 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 <laughs> we're still figuring things out. Here. And it's even worse with <clears throat> the skin... Like some of the soft tissue preservation you can't even see. You have to use like UV fluorescence or laser fluorescence. So if you can't even see the skin, how you prep these things or like it, it starts getting, there's a lot of different steps that get added when there's the possibility for skin. Yeah, so Steve and the other preparators have to strike this delicate balance of keeping the fossil as safe as possible, but also make sure that for any possible analysis we want, might want to do in the future, that we're not changing the chemistry of the fossil. Uh, which brings us right to our next question that I'm gonna to give to Steve, maybe we can swap places here. Um, so Drew's brother, John, age eight, would like to know what kind of glue you put on the fossils. Ooh, well you can walk over to our glue station first. Glue station time. <laughs> All right. So most of what we use every single day, if I cut to the chase, is a, a, a solution called Paraloid B72. Some people call it acryloid B72, it's the same thing. These are, are basically just clear plastic beads that you throw into acetone. The beads dissolve in the acetone, and then um, when you uh, apply the acetone to a fossil, acetone has a really high vapor pressure, so it evaporates really fast, and it uh, leaves behind the plastic. So now you have a plastic that is both coating the bone and it gets into the trabecular bone. That's soft and spongy, and it makes it rigid. That's why we call it both a glue and a consolidant. And um, as, as scientists, we really like this glue because we call it a reversible adhesive. So all we have to do is add acetone to it, and then we can get rid of the glue again if we need to do something like add a piece to it or do some kind of analysis. We have other glues that we use in I call it the forbidden, I hesitate to say emergency situations, but glues that are permanent. So this is an example, this is a paleobond. Paleobond comes in a variety of different types, so this is very liquidy, this is the penetrant stabilizer. You hit a fossil with this, give it a number of seconds, maybe a minute, 
it is solid. It is nothing is ever moving anywhere again, basically, unless you use brute force. So it does a good job, but it's a reaction adhesive, so it's not reversible. So we're very careful about when we use that. I might be a little more liberal with it than some other preparators. Some preparators think it causes damage to bone over time, or at least we don't know whether or not it does. I'm sort of in between. But yeah, in fossil preparation, there are a lot of debates about what kind of glues we should be using. So mostly acetone-based adhesives. It's not like nail varnish, right? <laughs> yeah. S something that's dissolved in acetone. Are there more questions? Yeah, your uh, nail polish, I'll just say, if, if you don't know what acetone is, nail polish is about 70% acetone. Yeah. Yeah. Nail polish remover is acetone. There was a question I heard the other day, what does a fossil preparation lab smell like? <laughs> acetone. It smells like nail polish. It does. Remover. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, back to Tyrannosaurus. Sorry. <laughs> um, why was why is the nasal so rough and bumpy? Why why have all those bumps and texture on the nasal? It's not a muscle attachment. Um, it's a good question. So why is the nasal so bumpy? Um, I'm not an expert on pterosaurs. However, it's interesting that the nasal the nasal fuses. So there's two nasals, just left and right nasals. But in pteranosaurs, they fuse very early in growth and they get this rough texture on top. So they're already fused up. Why get the rough texture? Yeah, so maybe it's a display feature. Maybe if those rough bony spikes are the basis for uh, keratinous covering, maybe there's like tyrannosaurs had a more spiky snout um, when they're younger, and then when they get like big bertha and they're really huge, they do spikes uh, become less prominent. And that might sound a bit weird, but actually, one of the things that we found um, over the last 20 years, uh, especially when we were at Museum of the Rockies, is, um, is that it's interesting that many of these display features of these dinosaurs actually get less prominent after the subadult stage. So, they, they, like in Triceratops, the spikes around the edge of the frill are very prominent and spiky when they're young, and then they broaden out and flatten when they get really old. So some of these display features are actually most prominent when these animals are kind of like teenagers, if you like. Uh, maybe that says something about display, I don't know. But uh, I suspect the spikes on the nasals of tyrannosaurs are probably a display feature. But why are they more prominent in the subadults? That's a question, I don't know. Awesome. <laughs> Well, we're probably winding down, but uh, get your last minute questions in, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Okay, here, here's a hard one. How many different types of dinosaurs are in the museum's collection? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, when I started here, we should probably move into the office. It's a little bit easier to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, when I, when I started here, we had a, a modest collection. Um, God, that sounds kind of egotistical. Now we've got a great collection. Um, we've collected an awful lot over the last uh, six field seasons. Um, so we have a good representation of different species from the Hell Creek and from the Judith. However, you know, we don't have complete skeletons of, of lots of things. We have a beautiful, complete Triceratops skull. We're getting lots of Tyrannosaurs. Um, so I, d I have no idea how many species we have. I really don't. Um, but... I mean, we have examples of at least half of the Hell Creek dinosaurs. Some of the smaller raptors um, we don't have, um, although I have found parts of some of the really, by definition, the very rarest things from the Hell Creek. Um, but the my collection here. Um, so um, in the Judith, we've got. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> there are more than three. How yeah. is lots. I mean, we've got mo examples of most things, but I'd love to have complete examples of most things, but, you know, that's very difficult. We're getting there, though. We're getting, we're getting good specimens every year, obviously. Uh, any other 3D prints that you're going to make uh, available, like the Tyrannosaur heads? For sale? Yeah. Um, well, yes, we will. This isn't ours. Now, this... This is a 3D print of, um, 
the Wankel Rex, and you can download this file online. Um, but we want to produce something like this for sale in our shop. And we will be uh, in a position soon. We're getting the reconstruction of the B2 skull done. And we'll print this out full size. It's going to be full size on display with the real bones. So you can see all those beautiful jaws full of teeth. And you'll be able to see a reconstruction of the complete skull with it. Uh, but the nice thing about 3D models is you can shrink them down and, and print them out a third of the size, a half of the size, whatever. Um, and, and they can be in the shop. One thing we do have in the shop, uh, we have magnets. These are a couple of my test ones, but these are for sale in the shop. So these are little fridge magnets, um, about $15. This one's a bit big actually, because it sticks out of your fridge. I printed out like 10 different sizes to see which one was the right size, and we ended up with this one. So uh, we have those as well. But yeah, we are, we are looking at doing 3D prints for sale in the shop of all the stuff that's cool that we've got. So the Lambiosaur will eventually be available. Um, that one's quite good because it looks good from one side. Um, but yeah, um, that and the Tyrannosaurs, I don't know what else right now. Maybe a nose horn of a Centrosaur, we have one of those. Interesting things that people would like. I'm totally about making a 3D model and uh, selling those things if, there's, if it's doable. Yeah, we've, di we've discussed a lot of these things. I, I can guarantee we'll have some cool stuff out in the coming years. And you know, the, the, the money that gets made out of those goes straight into the Paleo program. Um, and the, the, um, the, the busts of the Tyrannosaurs, 12.5% of those goes to Andrea Tuchin. I haven't sent him his check yet, but we're getting the, the end of year things together. And he gets that very, very soon. But like the artist does get, is supported by the sale of these as well. Uh, so when you're wandering, when we're wandering around in the field, how do we know when we've found a dinosaur fossil? Um, prospecting is both easy and difficult. Sometimes there's loads of bone, loads of it everywhere. And the trick is really figuring out whether it's any good, whether it's something that is worth finding, whether it's something rare, whether it's something well preserved. So you really have to know how to identify a little fragments. Um, and usually what we look for is texture. Um, I always say shape is your enemy. People say look at shapes. Like no, no, no. Shape, things get weathered into all sorts of weird shapes. But you need to know what the textures are like both inside the bone and outside the bone. How thick is the outer layer? Um, what shape are the little holes inside the bone? Because all the different species look a little bit different. And um, there's a number of different tricks that I teach to people in the field as to how to identify stuff. Um, which is based on some of the things I was taught um, back in England in the Isle of Wight by some of the great collectors there. Um, so th there's, a, there's a trick to it. Um, but identify what you've got, and if it's like, well, this little fragment, like um, Holger, they were just shattered lumps. I mean, that premaxilla was pretty obvious, but the rest of it, it looked like skull because it was covered in this very fine, porous texture, sort of rough and pitted and porous. It looked like Tyrannosaur skull, so it wasn't just the premaxilla with the tooth slots that was pretty obvious. We could see that all the other bones there were skull as well. Even if they were shattered and I couldn't really tell what they were, we could tell they were skull and they were Tyrannosaur skull. So the potential was there, basically identified at that site, because we could identify the little fragments. And that was, that was Jack Wilson who, who found that site and said, oh, there's this Tyrannosaur stuff. Was, uh, yeah, he used it for system. Let's go back in the lab. question. <laughs> so, how do people get to volunteer in the lab? How many volunteers can you fit now versus two years from now? <laughs> That's a good question. So, um, right now, this lab, <clears throat> we're at a point where uh, we can uh, uh, take in more volunteers. Sometimes the lab does get a little crowded, but I have a lot of. Uh, high school and college students. Um, and it's smaller so you can fit more of them in. <laughs> yeah, and... There are laws against it, though. <laughs> they move on and, you know, they do other things, as you do, so um, uh, I'm always looking for new volunteers. Um, you can email me or Denver. Uh, my email is on our uh, website. And um, w what I ask for is a, a regular commitment. Um, I want you to be able to come in uh, at least weekly. Uh, and... Uh, 
um, typically, there it is. There you are. You can email Steve, there you go. <laughs> Freeze frame. <laughs> Typically, my volunteers do live here, or at least they're, they're students here, but we do have instances where we have some seasonal volunteers that come from other places. Um, they'll prep in the spring, a couple of months, and then they're on their way, but they come back the next year. So there are a variety of ways to do it. I'd be happy to, to talk to you uh, and try to organize something. I'm, I'm always willing to work with people. And we have other ways to volunteer here, too. It's not just fossil prep. We can do collections volunteering and other yeah, things. So, I mean, Amanda's been spending a lot of time doing 3D scanning recently because we're trying to get all these models together. But she also works with the beautiful fossils. When Steve and his crew have finished cleaning up in the lab, Amanda gets to play with them in collections, put them in the boxes, and arrange them in the drawers, and then that sort of thing, too. So uh, some people like sort of... That, that side of things, you don't have to get covered in dirt. You can, uh, you can work in the clean, well, I say clean, uh, the cleaner part of the museum. Um, and then, you know, if you want to learn, I know there's a few people who want to learn the 3D printing. Um, and so similar, like, um, I think I mentioned at the beginning, the, the course that's being offered at DSU, you know, the facility here at the museum has a lot of different aspects of paleontology that certainly some of our volunteers from the university want to learn everything about paleo. And, there's a lot to learn here. I won't say everything, but you know, we do 3D scanning, 3D printing, various prep. We've got some of the latest tools, all sorts of things. So there's lots of different aspects of paleontology that people can learn coming to the museum and, and uh, volunteering and being part of this. Open the uh, bottom left cupboard over there. The bottom left cupboard. Yeah. Just as just a quick. Those are all in there, the latest tools. Those are boxes full of uh, air scribes that are the cutting edge, mostly Zoic Paleotech tools. So that's a box that has the relatively new Velociraptor 2. There's also a micro jack in there. There it is. It's a very new, really nice air scribe. And we have a bunch of stuff like this. Um, we have all the classic air scribes too, lots of different tools. And uh, if you are able to commit hours and, and, and you have good manual dexterity, you're not going to break things and drop things and things like that, then we can teach you how to use these things. So if you're interested in, in the lab, email Steve. If you're interested in fieldwork volunteering, email Denver. And if you're interested in college classes, email me. Yeah. Uh, like Denver mentioned earlier, this spring we're going to be teaching uh, an evening fully online paleo discussion class. We're going to read a lot of evolution papers, mostly dinosaurs, not all dinosaurs. Um, we'll talk about anything people want to talk about. Um, so if you're interested in joining an upper level paleontology discussion group, uh, it will be Tuesday evenings, it'll be a lot of fun. So get in touch and hopefully that's a success and then we'll do them more. Uh, sl slightly different topics each time, different times, try and catch different time zones around the world. Yeah, I mean, I think between the university and, and the museum, there's a great potential for, um, for collaborating and creating a program. I think there's a lot of people out there who want to do a paleontology program. Um, we have the biology program at the university already. We have great paleo um, facilities here and at the university. Liz has got her histo lab running. Um, and then there's a number of other evolutionary biologists there at the university too. So, and it's a very affordable university. So I think there's a, as people who are interested in that kind of thing, especially courses that can be done remotely. Anyway, two of them, Mitch. Which, uh, email Liz if you're interested. Like, I think it's great potential. We're super excited about it, and it's going to be in the spring. Uh, it's a while since I've been involved in a discussion class, and I like to argue, so uh, it'll be really cool. I mean, we've already got like uh, some of our volunteers here in the lab. They're going to be on that course. It's going to be great. Yeah. All right, so last question. It's last not, question. not a T-Rex question. Oh, good. How many Mesozoic mammals do you have? Um, we don't have many Mesozoic mammals, but we do have some. Um, there's a historical collection. We've got, I think, a couple of jaws. Um, when I was working in the Hell Creek on the American Prairie Reserve, we found an associated, it's not brilliant, but it's an associated skull of a didelphodon. It has a parts of both lower jaws and parts of the upper jaw, but those are on loan. 
uh, being studied. They're not, you know, they're not complete, they're not as amazing as some of the other world specimens you'll see, but um, there's not many associated digelphodons out there, so that's one of those. And we have a beautiful little jaw we got from the Judith, actually. It was one of the first things we found in the Judith, and then we never found another one. I think you got one this summer, right? We have one at the egg site, a nice, complete uh, Campanian mammal jaw. Yeah, we, don't, we keep our eyes open for them. I mean, I found a few in the Hell Creek over the years. When I was at the Museum of the Rockies, but I've not found we've not found too many. But you know, we got I don't know, let's say five, something like that, five or six. We got more lizard, I think, than we have got mammal. But we, we do collect a lot of that very small stuff. We've got a bunch of bird remains, um, you know, micro remains. We do get, you know, we collect quite um, keenly. <laughs> All right. Okay. So is that? Uh... Well, I guess I guess. Uh, hope hope we answer lots of questions. Uh, obviously, this is the live part. You can message questions to the web page or whatever if you've got things you want to ask. Uh, otherwise, thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching the presentation. And uh, we'll try and do more of these kinds of live things uh, because they're great for our local TV channel. And uh, I think they've been popular when we've done it in the past. So whenever we come up with something interesting, we'll try and do a live stream. I'll get Steve to shout, I promise you. That's me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, All thanks right. very much, and uh, goodbye. Goodbye.